Good evening. I'm Judy Wardrobe. And I'm Hari Srinivasan. On the news hour tonight. It is time for us to come together as one united people. The voters have spoken. Donald J. Trump is the president elect of the United States. Now the country looks for a path forward. We have seen that our nation is more deeply divided than we thought. But I still believe in America, and I always will. Plus, we bring together a variety of voices to reflect what a Trump presidency means for the nation. Then a view from abroad, how the rest of the world is reacting to Trump's win. There has also been a series of comments from China about the fact that this makes um, American democracy look rather peculiar at best. And why prediction polls and the media were so far off, putting a spotlight on what was missed in election coverage. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Hillary Clinton summed up her crushing loss to Donald Trump today, saying, this is painful and it will be for a long time. As for the new president-elect, he stayed out of sight after claiming victory in the wee hours. That left the national stage today to Clinton for perhaps one last time. The sting of their shocking loss was visible on the faces of Clinton's supporters and staffers in New York this morning as she conceded defeat. Last night, I congratulated Donald Trump and offered to work with him on behalf of our country. I hope that he will be a successful president for all Americans. We have seen that our nation is more deeply divided than we thought. But I still believe in America and I always will. And if you do, then we must accept this result and then look to the future. Donald Trump is going to be our president. We owe him an open mind and the chance to lead. The concession came hours after Trump was declared the winner, with more than the 270 electoral votes needed for election. Though Clinton led late today in the popular vote, she urged supporters, especially young people and women, not to lose heart. I've had successes and I've had setbacks, sometimes really painful ones. Many of you are at the beginning of your professional, public, and political careers. You will have successes and setbacks too. This loss hurts, but please never stop believing that Fighting for what's right is worth it. I, I know, I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. Roughly nine hours earlier, President-elect Trump had declared victory, applauding his opponent and calling for national unity. Hillary has worked very long and very hard over a long period of time, and we owe her a major debt of gratitude for her service to our country. I mean that very sincerely. Now it's time for America to bind the wounds of division, we have to get together. To all Republicans and Democrats and independents across this nation, I say it is time for us to come together as one united people. Trump also reprised some of the themes of his campaign, hinting at potential priorities for his coming administration. I've spent my entire life in business looking at the untapped potential in projects and in people all over the world. That is now what I want to do for our country. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. President Obama had gone all out to make Clinton his successor, but with the question decided, he announced he will meet with Trump tomorrow. The presidency and the vice presidency 
uh, is bigger than any of us. So I have instructed my team to follow the example that President Bush's team set eight years ago and work as hard as we can to make sure that this is a sex successful transition for the President-elect. Because we are now all rooting for his success in uniting and leading the country. Like Clinton, Mr. Obama had argued Trump was unfit for the White House. Today, he urged Americans to accept the result. We try really hard to persuade people that we're right. And then people vote. And then if we lose, we learn from our mistakes, we do some reflection, we lick our wounds, we brush ourselves off, we get back in the arena. We go at it. We try even harder the next time. The election outcome brought out strong feelings from both sides overnight outside Trump Tower in New York. We've had eight years of a liberal person telling us that, you know, middle America was nothing. And tonight they came out and they said, you know what? We are, we are America. And in Washington, outside the White House itself. As a gay, black, and Latino man, I'm scared. It sucks. <laughs> this is not um, the way that I envisioned America in 2016 to be at all. But Republican leaders in Congress who kept their distance from Trump embraced the result today. Look at what a unified Republican government can get you. In Wisconsin, House Speaker Paul Ryan lauded the ongoing Republican majorities in Congress and put supporters of President Obama's health care law on notice. This health care law is collapsing under its own weight. And so to your specific question about repealing and replacing Obamacare, problem is President Obama vetoed it. Now we have President Trump coming who is asking us to do this. So with unified Republican government, we can fix this. We can fix these problems. The Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, was also out today after having little to say about Trump during the campaign. Well, I know he's really happy. He's, we still have a Republican majority, and uh, we look forward to working with him. I think most of the things that he's likely to advocate we're going to be enthusiastically for. Now the president-elect has 73 days to work on his agenda in Congress and his transition before he takes office on January 20th. Our John Yang and Jeffrey Brown spent the final days on the road following the Trump and Clinton campaigns and join us now where it all came to an end last night in New York. Jeff Brown, I want to start with you. You were there at the uh, celebration last night and today uh, you were outside Trump Tower. What did you see? Who did you talk to? I was, at, I was at Trump Tower this afternoon, Harry. Things had calmed down by this afternoon. Uh, you heard last night was a little bit more dramatic. This afternoon, it was a classic New York, New York, New York scene. Lots of uh, people gawking across the street. We were all held across the street. Some demonstrators, a few demonstrators, uh, anti-Trump, a few Trump supporters were there. Uh, cops saying, you know, take your photos and move on, folks. Take your photos and move on. That kind of that kind of situation. The most dramatic thing was that in front of the Trump Tower, where I think I counted seven or eight very large dump trucks filled with sand. Those are obviously for protection against explosives. Something about the, it tells you about the world we, we, we live in today. And, and I can't help but, um, I couldn't help but reflect as I was there on the, again, going back to thinking about last night, the surreal nature of much of this, to be looking at Trump Tower, the wealth of Fifth Avenue. Gucci is at the, in the bottom floor of wealth, to, of, of uh, Trump Tower, excuse me, to think about how this wealthy uh, New York businessman somehow managed to connect with so many Americans and is now our president-elect. Jeff, you were telling us uh, that today you reached out to connect with some of the people, Trump supporters you met uh, when you were following him on the campaign trail. Tell us about that. Well, I did, Judy. I mean, I was, th you know, being there last night, I can't help, I still can't help but think that so many of the people I was with in that room did not think that what, ha what happened would happen. They, they, of course, wanted to win. Many thought there might be a win, but I don't think they expected quite what we saw. So I went back to talk to some of the people that I'd met over the last week, you know, thinking to myself that I was surprised by last night, but when I go back and think about people I talked to and what I saw, I'm, I'm, I'm much less surprised. I mean, I talked to Zan Bunn, who's the head of the North Carolina Federation of Republican Women, and, and she went directly to Obamacare. You just mentioned that in your lead-in tape piece. She said, remember, people were opening their envelopes with their much higher premium at the exact moment when they were opening their, their ballots, their absentee ballots to vote. 
and, pe and there was that disconnect for there for people. She said people do not want, just decided they did not want more of the same. I talked to Ann Setz Seltzer, the um, uh, pollster in Iowa. She said it was just really clear in Iowa the trade issue was resonating. You drive along the roads in Iowa, you see factories closed, towns dried up. Now, I had talked to her about Iowa when I was there, but what we saw last night, it was clear that that had connected much further up into parts of the Midwest. And, and I talked to Jeff Kaufman from uh, the Iowa Republican Committee, and he just said it came down to uh, Americans looking at two imperfect candidates, but looking and feeling like the best chance of yep. having real change was through Donald Trump. All right. Thanks, Jeff. I also want to check in with John Yang. John, the, the mood looked almost very somber, almost like a funeral today, at least from what we could see on TV, where Hillary Clinton and her supporters were. Well, that was uh, not just supporters, Harry. That was senior staff. Those were the staffers uh, uh, from the uh, Hillary for America organization from the office in Brooklyn. And it was absolutely shell-shocked uh, in there. No one saw this coming that I could talk to. Uh, everyone, I, I asked them when they when they saw uh, as they were going in when they first got the senses of trouble, uh, uh, and they all said that it was not until uh, uh, well into the night last night it was uh, that they started to get the sense that things were not going as they anticipated. I tried to engage them and try to find out well what do you think happened? What do you think if you had done this uh, earlier in Michigan? If you had done that. Uh, in another state, and they just waved me off. One of them said, I have never been less interested in talking about this than now. John, just quickly, uh, there was some comment today about the fact that Hillary Clinton waited until this morning to give her speech. Uh, what about, what, what was the thinking behind that? Well, got a couple of things. One practical, they had to get out of the Javits Center at 2 a.m. this morning. There was another uh, event moving in, and they had to tear down that elaborate setup and set up uh, for the National Association of Broadcasters. Uh, the other thing is that they really they weren't ready. They had to look at the races that were still open, look and try to figure out where the votes were, whether they had a shot in any of the states that were still open. And also, quite frankly, I don't think they were um, that, that she, that Hillary Clinton, was emotionally or psychologically ready to give that speech last night. All right. John Yang and Jeffrey Brown joining us from New York tonight. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So the presidential race is decided, and Republicans will still control both houses of Congress with slightly smaller majorities. In the Senate, Republicans won at least 51 seats, and they are favored to win a runoff in Louisiana next month. Democrats added two more Senate seats, including New Hampshire. Democrat Maggie Hassan defeated Kelly Ayotte, the Republican incumbent. Over in the House, Republicans won at least 238 seats. Now that is down nine from their current number. We dig in now on what we learned from the presidential results and what voters said leaving the polls. We turn to Lisa Desjardins, who is joined once again by Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report. Amy Walter, nine hours we were here together last <laughs> night. Imagine seeing each other again so soon. I never want to leave here. Thank you for joining us. Of course. So America is becoming more diverse. And as we look at what happened last night, we'd been talking going into this election a lot about race. That was supposed to help Hillary Clinton, but what actually happened? Yeah, and what we saw from the exit polls last night is a couple of things. The first is Donald Trump did a little bit better than uh, Mitt Romney did among white voters. But, we've got some but not data. by... Not by a whole lot, by one point. You will see Mitt Romney 20 points, Donald Trump 21 points. But there's another side of the story is that the African American and Latino percentage that Clinton got, impressive, winning by 80 and 36 percent, mm -hmm. but not to the margins mm -hmm. that Barack Obama got. And there's another story in there as well. And I think that we look at white voters, we've been dividing white voters into these different groups and we've talked a lot about white college educated voters these were the voters that the clinton campaign thought were going to tip the victory to her she was going to get a combination of the obama coalition those younger more diverse voters as well as these su suburban white women mm -hmm. who lived in and around big cities she did better than barack obama and this is specifically this among is white, white women. women okay but look at donald trump did eight points better among those without a college degree. Now, she performed 12 points better, he was eight points better, and it showed up on the map. So what you're saying here is that she did well with traditional Democratic Obama coalition 
forces, but just not as well as President Obama. Not as well as President Obama. I and, think. And did they show up for her as well? You're saying she didn't get as high a percentage of those who came to show up, uh, who came to the polls, but did as many blacks, right. as many Hispanics come out, or did more whites, did they have higher turnout? You know, I was just digging into one state in particular, which was Michigan, and it was clear that Detroit didn't turn out mm -hmm. at the level for her that it did for Barack Obama. On top of that, she did much worse in some of the exurban or rural parts of the state. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania all tell the same story. That's what I wanted to get to. I think that was the biggest surprise of last night was this blue wall of That's Hillary right. Clinton's. Maybe there was never a wall this year or certainly collapsed very quickly. And I, I said this uh, on election night. If you had told me going into this election that a Democrat was going to win Virginia and Colorado, I would have said, well, that candidate is probably going to win the nomination. Those are two big, they were two of the closest states last time. And that what I would not expect, <laughs> of course, is that Wisconsin and Michigan, two states that have gone for Democrats since 1988, um, would flip to Republican. And a lot of that is built on this. Which are the states that have more women who graduated from college, those who have fewer women who graduated from college? When you look at the numbers in That's those states, you can see that in Wisconsin and Michigan, yeah, it was a blue wall. It was a blue wall for Democrats when Democrats were doing better among white voters, and specifically white voters who didn't live in urban areas, so and white voters who didn't have a college education. Okay, so all this is about demographics, but I wonder, Amy, is the point that last night was not about demographics, that there's something else going on? That, that's absolutely true, and I think a lot of us in the business, uh, we got really wedded to this idea of demographics, especially because we watched Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012 with this amazing analytics team that told mm -hmm. us that you could actually look at the demographics of an electorate and understand where they were going to vote. It's mathematical. But it's all about yeah. math, but really it's also about message. Barack mm -hmm. Obama had a message. It was hope and change. It was that he had the auto bailout. He was mm -hmm. working for people. Hillary Clinton didn't have that message. It didn't address the rising anxiety and frustration and anger that's been brewing there, the time for change theme. Donald Trump did. Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report. I look forward to what you find out in the next week of Reading Through. <laughs> Thank your you. analysis. Thank you. For more on Donald Trump's stunning upset and what it means, we're joined by Ellen Fitzpatrick, presidential historian and author of the book, The Highest Glass Ceiling, Matt Schlapp, chairman of the American Conservative Union, J.D. Vance, author of the new book, Hillbilly Elegy, Betsy McCoy, former lieutenant governor of New York and an economic advisor to the Trump campaign, Stephanie Brown James, she's the former director of African American Outreach for President Obama's 2020. 12 campaign, and Ali Nirani, executive director of the National Immigration Forum. And we welcome all of you to the news hour. I just want to go around the group first and ask you just to give me a sentence, starting with you, Matt Schlapp, on your reaction today. What do you think about these results? Well, I have to say I feel a bit vindicated. It's been a tough campaign, I think, for both sides. It's been grueling. The, the word I kept using was raw. And uh, I think nobody expected, or very few people expected, for Trump to just explode in the Electoral College like he did. And uh, it's a fantastic night uh, for anybody who wanted change in Washington. Stephanie Brown James. I think raw is actually a, a great question. I mean, a, a great um, response that Matt gave. A lot of people um, that are in my community are feeling very raw today because the wounds that Donald Trump opened when he had so many disparaging remarks against minorities, against women, um, we continue to have those wounds um, really rubbed into today with him now being the president. And a lot of us are wondering, how do we tell our children um, that a person who can be, you know, a bully, who can talk badly about women, is now the president of our country? Betsy McCoy, what are you thinking today? The results were a repudiation of Hillary Clinton's class warfare rhetoric. Americans don't hate rich people. They would like to be rich. And Donald Trump's proposals to lift everyone by increasing prosperity, more jobs, more take-home pay, really resounded. 
Ali Nirani? I think the Trump victory is, uh, a, has tapped an emotional nerve. So I would capture this as a very emotional day. Uh, when, you talk, when we're talking to people across the Latino community, the Asian community, and their allies across the broad American public, there are a lot of raw emotions, um, some obviously in favor of Trump, the Trump win and others really wondering where we're all going. J.D. Vance, where are you today? Well, I think it's just remarkable how wrong the conventional wisdom was. It was utterly shocking that Donald Trump won to people who lived on the coast. But to people who <laughs> lived in the areas that I come from, it was utterly predictable. And that suggests something really, really broken about our political culture. And Ellen Fitzpatrick. Well, I was surprised that the uh, polling was so uh, inaccurate in some sense. And I was also... Uh, I really thought, having, as a historian, studied the history of women's quest for the American presidency over a long period of time since Victoria Woodhull ran for the presidency first in 1872, that uh, Hillary Clinton uh, was going to break through that glass ceiling this time. I, I did have that expectation, so I was quite stunned, actually. Matt Schlapp, I wanted to ask you, what's the message that all these millions of voters who voted for Trump, what are they sending? You know, I just feel like they feel like they're cut out of what's happening in Washington. They feel like they're cut out of the economic opportunity that Americans always felt was a part of the American dream. You know, when you don't have your real income, your take-home pay increase for a decade or a decade and a half, uh, it makes you awfully discouraged. And then when you see... Uh, other things in society changing so rapidly, uh, and you think that government's ineffective and unable to, uh, incapable of taking steps, appropriate steps, to make sure that America can lead, lead on the international stage and lead the international economy. Uh, I think that was so much of this. But I think it was also, look, it was a repudiation. I think, I think the voters like President Obama. He has very high approvals. I give him, you know, credit for that. But I do think his policies have hurt more people. You can see that by the poverty statistics. And I think this was a bit of a repudiation of Obamacare and his policies. I also think Hillary's corruption, she just could never get through that. Look at all those exit polls. I mean, they're just astonishing. The, the voters really made a judgment on Hillary Clinton's ethics. Stephanie Brown James, I wanted to ask that message that those voters are sending counter that with the message that the Hillary Clinton campaign was sending and which why didn't her message if she had one that was clear why didn't that prevail well I think that's the major challenge and that a lot of people especially in in the black community Latino community did not feel as though Hillary Clinton had a direct enough message for them to explain why she was the right choice not just based off of experience but what it was that she was going to do for these communities uh, to continue to uplift them um, if she became elected president you know one of the challenges uh, that I've been saying for a long time is that you know a campaign is won by your infrastructure and your ground game and unfortunately what we didn't see enough of from the Clinton campaign was a strong enough ground game to reach out to voters, to get real time, real information from people who you are asking for their votes, um, to be able to, to, to determine um, how best to continue to engage them. And I think that the Clinton campaign and the Democrats relied too heavily on President Obama to turn out the, the base of voters they needed to get Hillary Clinton the win. And what we saw was that uh, enough effort was not put in to make sure that those voters who needed to go to the polls and strong numbers, African-American, women, youth, Latinos, it just wasn't enough. Betsy McCoy. I'd like to jump in on that issue of the ground game because uh, I drew the opposite conclusion, that this election really demonstrated that emphasis on the ground game is now obsolete. Donald Trump had virtually no ground game, although the RNC had something of a ground game. He spent less than half as much a winning this presidency as his opponent Hillary Clinton did. And uh, I have to say the taxpayers are hoping that he will be as effective at getting his money's worth as president as he was as a candidate. I'll they, go ahead, uh, Stephanie. But, but they, were, they were reaching two very different audiences with two very different tactics. If you're drawing upon the emotional concerns of voters, as Matt mentioned, who are very much concerned that the America they know is being taken over by, by people who don't look like them, let's be frank, then that's an emotional appeal that's not going to be the same appeal for black voters, for example, who you need to, to knock on their doors and have conversations to say why they need to vote for Hillary Clinton. This isn't about 
why they should or should not vote for Donald Trump. It's about why should you vote for Hillary Clinton? And you need that ground game in order to help have people understand uh, why she should be your choice. And that, unfortunately, did not happen in strong enough numbers. I want to bring Ali Narani in here in terms of the message. Was it a case of Hillary Clinton not getting that message across? Or was it that Donald Trump's appeal was just so powerful to overwhelm whatever Hillary Clinton was doing? Well, when you look at the numbers, I mean, Hillary's uh, uh, message resonated in urban areas. But Donald Trump clearly uh, tapped into a nerve across suburban and rural America that we just haven't seen tapped in such a powerful way before. I mean, he overperformed what Romney was able to do in 2012, and he was able to run up those margins. So I think at the end of the day, this was an election, not just about emotion, but this emotion of anxiety, and an anxiety that was triggered by economic fears, uh, cultural fears. So we've been looking in, as we've been thinking about this over the last day, uh, this is this is a moment where we... This is the immigration forum. Right, right. At, at the forum, looking at this election as one about culture and values and what it means to be an American. And when you look at over the last few months, a lot of people, yes, they, a lot of Trump voters want to see a solution in terms of immigration. They want to see greater regulation, a greater, uh, stronger border. But some of their solutions actually are different from what the candidate put forward. So I think Donald Trump has an incredible challenge to translate his campaign promises into a consensus building policy. Betsy McCoy, do, uh, do the rest of Americans have something to fear when it comes to the, this, this gap between what Donald Trump had said on the campaign trail versus what he might do as president? I mean, you see the, you see the, you, you see the social conversations today, that there's a huge uh, group of people, whether it's women, whether it's minorities, wh whether it's immigrants, who are concerned uh, that they don't know where they stand with the new president. Yes. Well, actually, I thought I found most of his message quite unifying because it was, the emphasis was on prosperity. I did want to want to um, uh, touch upon something that one of our contributors said a moment ago about women and failing to break the glass ceiling. And here's how I see this: Hillary Clinton was urging voters to make history. But a lot of voters, particularly women, had trouble with her history. Um, and she was portraying herself as a feminist, as a glass ceiling breaker. But in fact, in the eyes of many women, especially women closer to Hillary Clinton's own age, she had gotten where she was primarily on her husband's coattails. She was less a Susan B. Anthony and more an Evita. And so they found this unconvincing. And millennial women who are out there every day. Yeah. Are competing with men don't see the issue. Ellen Fitzpatrick. I think this kind of rhetoric and uh, exaggeration that has really informed this entire campaign does very little to elevate the political process. And it's very unfortunate. It was amazing last night to see Donald Trump, who had been describing uh, Hillary Clinton as crooked and corrupt in a matter of a moment, was describing her as a fine and dedicated public servant once he had <clears throat> won the election. So there was a kind of barbarism all the way around, I think, in this political campaign in which the issues really were boiled down to very small sound bites. The impact of mass media on uh, presidential elections, a process in television which really began in 1960, is reaching its logical conclusion here. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's, the public is not well served by it, frankly. J.D. Vance, in your book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, Elegy, you deal, of course, with uh, white working class Americans, many of whom you write about feeling forgotten, disrespected. What do you think they are now looking for Donald Trump to do? And do you think he can deliver? For them. Well, just to answer the first part, yeah, what do you think they're looking for from him? Well, the first thing that I think they're looking for, for, they've already gotten, which is this sense of vindication that they predicted, they knew that the media was corrupt, that they were lying about the outcome of the election, and Donald Trump really proved them right in some ways. So I do think there should be some soul-searching from the press um, who predicted that Trump would lose very, very handily, but of course that didn't happen. And I think that corrodes some of the trust that a lot of folks back home have in the, in the mainstream press. Well, if I what could I just interrupt folks... for a second, that was based on polls that pretty universal we're showing Hillary Clinton ahead because we don't do our own polling. But go ahead, please. 
No, yeah, no, no, of course. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to be hypercritical of the press, but I think that even the polls suggested a fair amount of volatility, and there was a certain degree of certainty, even though I don't think that certainty was necessarily supported by the polls that suggested Hillary Clinton was slightly ahead, but not very comfortably ahead, as a lot of folks um, talked about. But I think what, what people want to see from, from the Trump presidency is fundamentally they want to see a more repaired and better path to the middle class. What a lot of folks feel, and, and, and some of the other commenters have, have mentioned this, is that there isn't a very clear way for somebody who's working class, who's middle income, to really get ahead in 21st century America. That implicates our education system. It also implicates our, our local and regional economies. And I think that folks will expect Trump to fix a lot of those things. But of course, it's a really tall order, and it's not going to happen overnight. Matt Schlapp, sometimes, you know, the saying is that campaigning's the easy part, governing's the hard part. As J.D. Vance just said, there's a lot of expectations that people have. All those people that put Trump into office, they want to see results. And now, technically speaking, no excuses. Congress, both uh, the House and the Senate, are Republican, as well as the White House. Well, what is the Trump deliverable in the first day, first 100 days, first year? Yeah, you know what? It's going to be time for us to put up or shut up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to reverse all of the problems we've seen in the economy um, that we've seen uh, with these working class voters, these blue collar voters that turned out in just droves for Donald Trump. But there were some actually some easy things we could do. Uh, our tax, uh, our corporate tax structure is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And many of us who are small business people actually pay at higher rates than corporations do. We have some of the highest corporate taxes in the globe. And what we're seeing is, is that corporations are leaving America for the sole reason of taxes. Second of all, we could do something about our regulatory structure. And look, you even just look at climate change. The impact of, of chasing after regulating carbon dioxide has really shed our economy of manufacturing jobs and, and additional energy jobs. We all know about the war on coal. You know, we can all have our opinions on things like climate change, but the, we, we can't disagree on the fact that it has shed so many jobs in these communities and in these states, states that Donald Trump did very well in. So Republicans, of which I'm a proud uh, member of that party, uh, being in control of Congress, although we don't have 60 votes in the Senate, and it's always important to say that, which is there's still going to be bipartisanship in all these things. We really ought to do something on our taxes, and we ought to do something on our regulatory structure, and we ought to be more competitive internationally. And then the investments that are sitting on the sidelines would start to flow into our economy. I and really think middle-class America will be well served by that, and of course, a fix of Obamacare. Let me turn to Stephanie Brown James, because you started out, Stephanie, by talking about raw feelings in the African-American community, other uh, the communities of people of color in this country. If the principal focus of a new president, Donald Trump, is on economic issues like what we just heard Matt Schlapp and Betsy McCoy describe, does that in some way reassure, assuage some of the concerns that you expressed? I mean, definitely, you know, there's no doubt about it that, you know, communities of color are very much concerned um, about the economy, being able to make sure that they have enough uh, food to give their family. So poverty is also a big issue. But the, the, the challenge comes down to respect. And if there's a president who you feel does not fundamentally see you as an equal to other uh, Americans, does not respect you, does not respect your life, then it doesn't matter what policy position they put forward or what plans they put forward because the humanity, um, you feel your humanity is not being seen by your own president or your own government. Um, but to be quite frank, you know, I, I'm excited to see uh, what the Republican Congress is going to do, uh, what uh, this new Republican president is going to do, because I do think that it is time to, to show up um, and, uh, to, and to prove that the policies that they say they want to put forth that's going to, you know, help the middle class, um, that it's going to actually make a difference. You know, I think people mm -hmm. co conveniently uh, like to forget that, you know, President Obama inherited a doomsday economy. So I want to see what this uh, Republican-led government is going to do to get, uh, to get us into a better shape. Holly oh, no. Narani, I just wanted to pick up on something that she just said. Well, how, how do you get these communities to feel respected? Well, I think we're in for an interesting ride. Um, I, I mean, I should start with, I do not believe that every person that voted for Donald Trump is a xenophobe or a racist. Um, on the other hand, some of the things that Donald Trump said over the course of 
uh, the, the campaign gave voice and gave permission to people uh, to do some very, very terrible things. I mean, just today I saw news of a, a swastika being painted on walls in Philadelphia. Um, so we're going to unfortunately see these kinds of things as we move forward through this administration. President-elect Trump, when he becomes President Trump, is going to have an incredible opportunity to heal this country and to be able to, in essence, take that permission away. Oh, just very quickly on this respect question, I think that's so right. But remember, I think actually this really boomeranged on Hillary Clinton. We focused so much on Donald Trump's rhetoric, but when she called uh, Donald Trump supporters a basket of deplorables, you can see it in the exits. It just destroyed her with these voters. And when she called Christians, not her, but her staff in these leaked emails called Catholics and Christians backwards, you can just see Donald Trump did, he actually won Catholic voters. So, you know, this idea of rhetoric out of control is something that really hurt Hillary Clinton in this race. J.D. Vance, how do you see this playing out? Well, I think that, first of all, Donald Trump and the Republican Party has to recognize that though they obviously won this election, if you look at their low numbers among black voters, among Latino voters, this is not a long-term coalition that they can build on. And so I really do think it comes down to respect. It comes down to being gracious. It comes down to really showing compassion for the problems of the black and Latino communities. And I really hope that Donald Trump takes the ball that's in his court and tries to go after those voters, tries to show some compassion, and really offers them something substantive to get excited about Republican and conservative conservative policy. Just a final word from Ellen Fitzpatrick on uh, bringing the country together. Is it possible? Of course it's possible, Judy. I, it, this was a very close election. And in fact, I believe Hillary Clinton, at least the latest count, shows that she won the popular vote. There was a lopsided vote in the Electoral College, as there often is. So we remain a very divided electorate. And it will be, of course, an imperative of the new president to try to address uh, those divisions and to bring the country together in order to govern. This is not a um, this is not the apprentice, and uh, in four years you're fired if you're not able to address the concerns of the American citizens. So, it's a tall order for someone without experience in politics or military service. And it's a new model. We'll, we'll get to see how it plays out. Well, the conversations are just beginning. This is only the first day after we've learned Absolutely. the results of the election. But we are so glad that you were all able to join us. Ellen Fitzpatrick, Matt Schlapp, we thank you, J.D. Vance, uh, Stephanie Brown-James, Betsy McCoy, and Ali Narani. We thank you. Now the view from overseas. The election was watched closely both with anticipation and fear. And as Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Margaret Warner reports, today the rest of the world awoke to an America profoundly changed. The stunning news ricocheted around the world from Tehran to Tokyo, Istanbul to Berlin, met with apprehension by some and applause by others. In Moscow, the Russian parliament erupted in cheers at the announcement. And President Vladimir Putin was among the first to congratulate Trump, who had lauded Putin as a strong leader. Nathan Hodge is a Wall Street Journal correspondent in Moscow. He says there is glee over the divisive U.S. election. Because it's a way that basically that Russia, which has seen lots of scolding from the United States and the West about the way that it conducts elections and, and the authoritarian tendencies of its leadership, uh, they can now point to the United States and say, look, you guys, um, you're not so great yourselves. Russia also left its imprint on the election with allegations that it engineered the hacking of Democratic Party emails to embarrass Hillary Clinton. All of this has NATO allies nervous. Its member states, especially in Eastern Europe, rely on the U.S. as a counterweight to Moscow and as guarantor of their security. Alliance leaders made clear today they are looking for Trump to maintain a tough line with Putin after Russia's annexation of Crimea and to abandon his campaign talk of putting conditions on a U.S. commitment to NATO. The president of Latvia says he's willing to give the incoming president some time. Of course, during the campaign, Trump came out with many blunt statements on many issues. But we should remember that it was a pre-election time. Let's see what the administration of the president will look like. But in France, President François Hollande said the result, quote, opens a period of uncertainty. 
Reaction in nationalist quarters of Europe was exultant. NewsHour special correspondent Malcolm Brabant spoke to us from Copenhagen. The right-wing leaders across Europe are basically seeing the Trump victory as a validation of their policies. You've got people like Marine Le Pen, who is the leader of the French National Front. She's going into a presidential election in six months' time. The latest polls give her about 30 percent of the vote, and she will see what happens what happened in America as being encouragement for French voters saying if it can happen in the United States why can't it happen here that nationalism already triumphed in Britain British yeah, Prime Minister Theresa May says her nation's special relationship with the U.S. remains. But she came to office last summer after British citizens voted for Brexit to abandon the European Union. Trump embraced the move, calling himself Mr. Brexit at one point. Also in question is America's participation in the Paris Climate Accord. Trump has called climate change a hoax, and while it would take four years to formally pull out of the agreement, there are no sanctions in place for ignoring it. German Chancellor Angela Merkel says she watched the U.S. election results, quote, with trepidation, but that she will work with Trump. Trump has called Merkel insane for taking in large number of refugees. The center of that refugee crisis remains in Syria, now in its sixth year of civil war. People in Aleppo, locus of the fighting now, say their low hopes for U.S. protection remain the same. We are trying to look at the bright side. Uh, Trump like, has no promises at all for the Syrian people. Uh, before we had empty promises. So now it would make us maybe more realistic. Elsewhere in the Middle East, there's unease over Trump's campaign calls to ban many Muslims from entering the U.S. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was one of the first world leaders to telephone congratulations overnight. But others in Egypt struck a different tone. He hates Muslims, whether he admits it or not. He's afraid of Arabs. On the other hand, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke with Trump today, calling him a great friend of Israel. His education minister put it more plainly, saying Trump's victory means, quote, the era of the Palestinian state is over. The Israeli government sharply opposed the U.S. nuclear deal with Iran, and Trump has suggested he'll try to renegotiate the lifting of sanctions it provided. Borzu Daragahi, Middle East correspondent for BuzzFeed in Istanbul, said that will be difficult. The U.S. could, in theory, uh, ramp up unilateral sanctions, but it never really ramped them down, except for the ones that were kind of imposed by uh, the executive. The ones that are by Congress were, were still in place and remain in place. The president-elect also wants to revisit major trade deals, such as the 12-nation Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has yet to be ratified. China's president, Xi Jinping, telephoned Trump himself today, voicing hope for, quote, non-conflict and non-confrontation. U.S. tensions with Beijing have ratcheted up over China's aggressive moves in the contested waters of the South China Sea. About Jillian Tett, the U.S. managing editor for the Financial Times in New York, America spoke of the Chinese reaction. reaction. There's certainly a lot of questioning, a lot of concern. There has also been a series of comments from China about the fact that this makes um, American democracy look rather peculiar at best. Closer to home, Trump's victory was met with alarm in Mexico City, given his talk of building a border wall and making Mexico pay for it. The Mexican peso crashed overnight, hitting levels not seen for more than 20 years. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Margaret Warner. In the wake of last night's huge upset, there are many questions about what the pollsters, the pundits, and many journalists may have missed. To tackle this, we are joined by Margaret Sullivan. She is the media columnist for The Washington Post. Steve Dace, he is a popular conservative radio talk show host in Iowa. And Jim Rutenberg is a media columnist for The New York Times. And we welcome all of you to the news hour. Margaret Sullivan, you're sitting here next to me. I'm going to start with you. We heard J.D. Vance say in that previous discussion in the program, uh, we saw the news media, he said, lying mm -hmm. about uh, what was going to happen in this election based on the polls. And I pointed out that we depend on the polls, but we don't do the polls ourselves. But 
How good a job or poor a job did the media do this time? Well, I don't think that the mainstream media was lying about what was going to happen. I think we missed the overarching story to a large extent, and that is a failure um, on our part. But it, it was not the result of a, a, you know, a plan or a lie or anything uh, as uh, quite as venal as that. Steve Dace, I want to ask, how, how much of this is a disconnect between the people who write the stories and the people who are outliving them in the middle of the country? I think it's a massive disconnect. And, you know, I'm somebody who used to work at a major city newspaper, which is considered mainstream or liberal media. I've done a lot of uh, work with USA Today and MSNBC, which are considered the same, because I like to engage people that have different ideas than me and maybe even persuade them. But I mean, how many people in the newsroom here right now at PBS, how many that work here? How many are pro-life? How many of them go to church or to mass once a week? How many of them voted for Trump? And I think there is, you get, uh, there's a lot of talk of a lack of diversity. There's a huge lack of ideological and cultural diversity in our newsrooms, and I think that's creating a massive disconnect nationwide. Jim Rutenberg, connect those two things. We just heard uh, Margaret Sullivan speak about how the press missed the story. Uh, and, and we hear Steve Day saying how disconnected we are from the rest of the country. How do you see all this? Um, well, I, I kind of, in a way, agree with all the above in that it's, it's indisputable that America's newsrooms, especially its mainstream newsrooms, are not diverse with ideological opinion. But, you know, a lot of journalists are not, don't consider themselves ideological, though much of the country doesn't believe that these days. So, uh, but I do believe that uh, we need people with different backgrounds. But new America, mainstream newsrooms aren't going to go looking for people who have ideological viewpoints. It's not what we do. Our editorial pages sh do, should. But you do want people who are at least grew up or kind of are, are immersed in the kind of thinking. The one thing I want to argue here, though, is that this isn't about geography. It's not about the middle of the country. And I wrote this today. that. It's a state of mind. And so there are people on Long Island who are hardcore Trump voters who I don't think are understood by most mainstream news reporters who live amongst them, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a psychology as much as, as it is about geography. Margaret Sullivan, uh, what about the idea that there's an affirmation bias in the press, that perhaps we went along with the polls because it was more palatable or whatever the prediction was more palatable and we didn't dig into the numbers on how the polls got to the way they were, especially in considering there was such uniformity. This was the year of magical thinking on the part of a lot of journalists. We thought that it would be, un it was unthinkable that someone who was insulting people, saying racist and xenophobic and sexist and mi misogynist things could become the president. And so we didn't really, many of us didn't really uh, deal with the idea that this could be the case. And, and the polls were close enough, and the election forecasts were often saying that uh, Hillary Clinton would, you know, win, and, you know, she was probable by 85 percent or something like that. So there were a lot of, a lot of factors working for us. I think that uh, we did get out into the different parts of the country and do some reporting. Did we do enough? Did we listen hard enough? I wonder about that. Steve Dace, you know, you, you brought up a moment ago, uh, journalists, the, dis, the whole disconnect point. You know, we've strived, I think, in newsrooms for years to become, we, as we like to put it, more like America, to be more diverse. But I hear you saying we've missed a whole chunk of the country in our effort to be diverse. I don't think there's any question about this. I read something in L.A. Times film critics said a year ago when American Sniper was the number one movie. And he said, listen, the only people surprised us at the number one movie are the people that live in the two coasts and haven't visited the 47 states in between. You know, what Margaret said about some of the things Trump said, I mean, that's why I was hashtag never Trump. I was disturbed by those things. But you know what also disturbed me? To hear Hillary Clinton say that I am her, quote, enemy. Uh, the comments that were made in the previous segment from the WikiLeaks emails calling Christians backwards. The fact that those of us who think that we shouldn't have men in bathrooms next to our young daughters are called bigots when we usually just call them parents. Those things create a backlash as well. So I don't fault the media for thinking that Trump couldn't get elected because of his incendiary comments. The fault, though, comes in the fact that an equal light was not shed on Hillary's incendiary comments and the backlash that created against her, which we saw in the vote total last night. Jim Rutenberg, what about that? 
Um, yeah, I think, and I think that what we learned from the, the lack of reaction, I think this is where we see the disconnect, how we, we ask ourselves, and including some never Trump Republicans, did the incendiary commentary from Mr. Trump not create a backlash, and how did he get elected in spite of it all? And I think that goes to, again, not understanding the level of anger in other parts of the country, and to my point, certain people everywhere. And they care much more about the ills that Mr. Trump was promising to, to cure than they cared about whatever personal traits we were writing about in, the, in our coverage. Margaret Sullivan, what about this uh, the potential of almost an observer effect? Having uh, Jim's paper, the New York Times or the Washington Post, having these predictions on a daily basis, seeing that Hillary Clinton is going to win by 92 percent probability or 85, does that end up having kind of a, a conf confirmation effect over time, saying, well, maybe I don't need to go out there and vote, or this is really the narrative anyway? Am I, am I countering that? Am I challenging that narrative with a different type of story? I think when you walk into the voting booth, it's a very emotional issue. And I believe that for many people, the idea of the Clintons back in the White House was something that when they actually walked into the voting booth, they just didn't want to countenance. And that you can talk about experience or inexperience or incendiary comments or, uh, you know, stronger together, or make America great again. But a lot of times, it's a purely emotional issue. And it speaks to how you feel about your life and the direction of the country. And I think that's really what we saw happening. Steve Dace, it's, a, it's such a big subject to look at how the media and a president interact. But if there were mistakes made in the campaign, how can the media, shall we say, be closer to the mark in how we approach covering the Trump presidency? You know, I think one of the big things, people misunderstood Fox's original appeal when it was launched 20 years ago. Its, it's original appeal is that it looked at, at institutions of Americana, the military, churches, the family. It did not look or view them with instantaneous suspicion because most Americans do not. And, and frankly, a lot of people that live in more progressive enclaves do. So I think, for example, treating those institutions that a lot of what you like to call flyover country or, as uh, the other, other guests pointed out, Long Island, uh, would consider to be Americana, but to deal with them objectively, I think that is key. And, and I also fear that the media has maybe made a mistake with Trump that we conservatives made with Bill Clinton in the 90s, where we were so over the top, so hysterical in our condemnations and conspiracies and the like, that when something serious came along, like a president lying under oath to a federal grand jury, a lot of Americans just sort of waved their hand, Judy, and said, oh, you guys are always the yeah. boy who cried wolf. In many respects, you guys have almost insulated Trump from any legitimate criticism he may have as president because they're just going to roll their eyes and say, there goes the media again. Well, there's much more to discuss here. And again, it's the first day after this election. These are all conversations that will continue. But thank you very much, all three. Steve Dace, Jim Rutenberg, Margaret Sullivan. Thank, thank you. you, Judy. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. In other news, proponents of legalized marijuana are celebrating Tuesday's results. Three states, California, Massachusetts, and Nevada, approved its recreational use. Voters in Florida, Arkansas, and North Dakota legalized pot for medical purposes. In other ballot measures, gun control initiatives passed in California, Nevada, and Washington State, and Nebraska voted to reinstate the death penalty. Donald Trump's victory staggered the financial markets at first, but they rebounded by the time the day was done. The Dow Jones Industrial Average soared nearly 257 points to close at 18,589. The Nasdaq rose 57, and the S&P 500 added 23. On the News Hour online right now, our election analysis continues. A prominent libertarian. All right. And later we'll tell tonight. you about that later because we got to get off the air. All right, later tonight. And that's the News Hour for tonight. I'm Hari Srinivasan. And I'm Judy Woodruff. For all of us at the News Hour, thank you and good night. You're watching PBS.